Good evening, everyone. This is David Mandel at OHEL, and welcome this evening. And joining us for a conversation on reimagining grief, what helps and what hurts. OHEL is very pleased to organize this evening with the collaboration of several organizations and leaders of organizations whom we will introduce shortly. The conversation this evening is on a deeply personal topic. What can we do and how do we understand grief? What actions from friends and family help and what hurts? I wanna thank Sivi Ryder, my colleague, Director of OHEL Trauma and Children's Services, as well as Cheryl Chernovsky, Coordinator of OHEL's Trauma Services for organizing this evening. The services that OHEL provides in relation to grief, trauma, from the OHEL ZACTA National, the, the OHEL ZACTA Family National Trauma Center, short-term bereavement and trauma counseling, retreats for special populations, sibling retreat that we've scheduled in mid-September, grief support programs, including a new grief companion program, case management services for people who've experienced loss and need help in nav navigating benefits and services. What is grief? Is there a good or a right way to grief? What can the community do or be more aware, more sensitive to children, parents, spouses experiencing grief? What is the best way to support them? We invite everyone listening in to pose your questions or comments on the chat function. You can either pose it publicly so that the hundreds of people on the chat may see it, or you can pose it privately and only I and one other colleague that are monitoring the chat will see that. We will get to as many questions as possible so that we can respond to individuals. We will also be following up at the end of this evening session with a brief questionnaire to everyone. And so that if your question was not posed or not answered, you'll have the opportunity to pose it and then we will absolutely get back to everyone. Let us begin with Dr. Norman Blumenthal, OHEL's director of the Zach the Family National Trauma Center to give us a perspective on tonight's conversation. Dr. Blumenthal. Thank you very much, David. And it really is truly a great honor to be part of this illustrious panel. And I really think it's a wonderful, um, <clears throat> perhaps antidote to the very difficult times that we're living in during the nine days that we're showing that we're able to display such unity between different organizations that accord one another mutual respect and support rather than competition. I also want to just add to the thank yous. I want to thank our secretary, Laura Bart, and Ari Kenigsberg, who's running the technology behind Zoom. When you're my age, you're particularly appreciative of those who can assist with technology. Um, many more years ago than I care to think, when I was somewhere around the age of 11 or 12, um, I went to sleepaway camp for the first time. It was Camp Clarina, may it rest in peace. And the director of the camp was actually a fairly illustrious figure himself, was Rabbi Dr. Yaakov Greenwald, for those of us in the field, now one of the early uh, pioneers of uh, blending the Torah world with the mental health world. But at that time, he owned the camp. And we were approaching Tisha B'Av. I don't remember clearly if it was actually on Tisha B'Av itself or a day or two before. And he ran a, a, a program for my division 
And he asked us, why is Tisha B'Av so sad? What is so tragic about Tisha B'Av? And different people were raising their hand and making suggestions, and he pretty much dismissed and rejected every one of them. I was still at an age where I wanted to please teachers and certainly a camp owner. So I was trying desperately to see if I could come up with the right answer. And I sort of said to me, um, as I said to myself, um, what's the saddest thing I can think about? And at that point, I raised my hand and I said, I think what Tisha B'Av is like would be like maybe your both your parents dying and you're an orphan. At which point he said, yes, that's exactly it. And sort of used my metaphor for the rest of his conversation, much to my delight. But little did I know that what I was saying would be a harbinger. I didn't know that time I'd be a bereavement specialist either, but was a, was a harbinger of what we're going to be talking about tonight, because we're in a period in our calendar where we are all grieving. We are all uh, in a state of grief, and it is the ideal time to then understand the grief uh, or the mourning of those individuals who had undergone or may be currently in the throes of an early law, a recent loss and early grieving. So it's a prime time for us as the community and for those grieving to sort of meet. Rabbi Soloveitchik makes a, a fascinating observation about the difference between what he refers to as covenantal grief, or I'll call it communal grief, and an individual's grief. And in a way, they're similar and they're different. And basically, what he describes is that there is sort of an inverse relationship. They kind of crisscross in terms of development. He says communal grief starts <clears throat> very light. It starts with an Asara Batavis. And then it, it grows to a Shavasa Batamas. And then it goes further with more restrictions and more laws of mourning to the three weeks. And then it, it progresses further with more and deeper grieving as we enter the nine days, all the more so Shua Shachalbo, the week of Tisha B'Av, and of course culminating with the most mournful day in our calendar, which is Tisha B'Av. So there's sort of a, if you will, a growth to Tisha B'Av. The individual's grief sort of takes the other direction. Certainly when the death first occurs, there's the shock, the horror, the uh, unimaginable uh, heart-wrenching pain of having lost a loved one. And then following the funeral and the burial comes the Shiva with all of its laws. And then come the Shloshim, the 30 days where there are less restrictions and less overt signs of mourning. And then there is for, for the year, certainly for parents, the year, and then there's the yard site. And so it goes from the most intense to less intense grieving. So they're in a way, a similar progression or, or, or regression, but they, they crisscross one another, but they meet, if you will, on Tisha B'Av. And it is on Tisha B'Av that the community and its grief for the temp destruction of the temple and for our galut, our diaspora, meets the grief of the individual who has lost a, a parent, has lost a sibling, has lost a child, has lost a spouse. When us Ashkenazim uh, leave the Shiva house, our tradition is to say to the mourners, Hashem should God should comfort you among the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. And a fairly obvious question is, why are we bringing up Zion and Jerusalem? We should just comfort the person. Hashem should comfort you for the loss of your particular individual, uh, for, your, for your spouse, for your sibling, for your child, for your parent. Why, are we bringing, why don't we say like the Sephardim do, you should have comfort from heaven. Why do we bring in Zion and Jerusalem? And I'm, I'm sure there are many answers, but the one I'd like to reference is that when we are comforting, or attempting to comfort the bereaved, we have to, as much as possible, validate and connect with that person, as imperfect as that connection may be. So therefore, we mobilize the universal loss, the loss that all of us feel, which is the loss of the Beit HaMikdash, the loss of our temple, the loss of that direct communion and connection 
with God much as an orphan loses that direct and immediate connection with one's parents. And therefore, we reference that joint uh, uh, grieving so that we can cross paths, that we can connect as best as possible. And that's what we're going to be doing tonight. We have the true experts in bereavement. We have remarkable individuals, all of whom I've gotten to know over the years and all of whom I have amazing respect for, who have suffered these types of losses and have and used their loss to comfort and connect with others. So they are the optimal, the best people to teach us how we can be sources of comfort to, to those who are in the, who those are in Avelo, to those who are mourning. I want to, before I hand it back to David to introduce our speakers, I just want to mention one, if you will, uh, sort of caveat or warning. A lot of this material may be very uh, difficult to hear. It, it may be, as we've been hearing about, a great deal of tragedy, a great deal of personal hardship and pain. And it's possible that for among the uh, hundreds of people who are listening, that it might evoke reminders, their own reminders of very painful periods in their lives or just connecting uh, as we should might be painful, might be triggering. You're not obliged to stay on. If you need to mute it and step away, that's understandable. That's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. It's a sign of how strong your connection is. But I want, want you to know that this is being recorded. If you need to hear the material in a more piecemeal basis, uh, you will have access to it. So please listen as much as you can, learn as much as you can, but don't try to be heroic in terms of taking in more than you can tolerate at a particular time. Again, it's my great privilege to be part of this. I can't wait to hear what we'll be hearing for the next uh, hour or so. And at this point, I'll pass it back to David to introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Blumenthal, for giving us the context for this evening and for also explaining to individuals that for some people, uh, this will be comforting to listen to this conversation tonight. And for some individuals, it may be um, more difficult. Uh, we're very honored to be joined by the founders of organizations that provide so much support to individuals, partnering organizations this evening, and we'll introduce uh, them all, uh, the founders of Samchenu, uh, Zisel's Links, Mayrim, and our tapestry. We'll introduce each of the individuals this evening who give remarks on the context, the topic that Dr. Blumenthal spoke about. We'd like to remind everyone that you have the opportunity to pose your questions and comments on the Q&A function, um, most likely at the bottom of your screen. And you can either do it publicly that several hundred people may see it, or you can do it privately. Only um, I and one of my colleagues will see your questions and will address as many as we can this evening. I'd like to ask each of my colleagues that are speaking that if you are using any Hebrew or any expressions uh, that are not in English, to please translate them so that everyone has the opportunity to understand it. Um, let me begin with Sora Rivka Cohn, the founder and director of Zisel's Link. Sora Rivka Cohn lost her mother at the age of nine. She's the founder and director of Zisel's Links and Schleimi's Club, an organization serving children and teens who've lost a parent. Through support publications, retreats, group events, and pro bono legal services. Their aim is to give families who've lost a parent know a sense that we are in it together. So Rivka Kohn, please, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. <clears throat> what a privilege to be amongst such a great group of people. And I know that for many, the topic tonight is a heavy one. And I think it takes a lot of courage to be here and show up either as a griever or as someone who 
would like to support those who are grieving in our community. So thank you for being here. I asked Hashem to give me the words to be able to speak tonight and I got them, but not in the way that I expected. So as I was preparing um, and setting up the Zoom here, my glasses cracked in my hands. <laughs> And I'm currently not in my home where I have a spare pair. And so I'm speaking to you while seeing definitely um, in a somewhat compromised state. And as I had that happening to me, it reminded me so much about what grief is. So first for a little bit of background as to my background with loss and a little bit about my journey to here. So I lost my mother as, doc, as um, David Mandel said, at the age of nine. And I was the first one in my school who had ever lost a parent. I was also one of the very few in the community that I grew up in, which was Muncie, who had lost a parent. I actually knew nobody my age who lost a parent. And it's not that many years ago. Um, I mean, I guess it depends for whom. It was such an isolating experience to be a kid who was figuring this out. Like, am I normal? Am I not normal? Um, are the feelings that I'm having before and after Yisker okay? Yard site, what are you even supposed to do? You know, kind of all these thoughts and questions. Um, but much like what you're seeing me without my glasses, I know how much effort it's taking for me right now to focus on the screen and be able to see you and engage even with those of you who I don't see. That's kind of what grief for me was like. And that's what it is like for many children. Was on the outside, on the surface, I was doing really, really well. I was the kid in school who had a lot of friends, um, was geo, just had a great time and a lot of fun. And there was a lot of hard work beneath that to keep that going. But I think the perception within the community and within many, even today, is that, you know, this person looks good. So it can't be that the grief is quote unquote affecting them. And what I'm here to validate is that there are so many different ways that we experience grief, particularly as children. And I know others will speak to this as adults, but for me, from a child's perspective, I can only say is that I experienced it deeply. I experienced it in a profound way but I also was able to put up a front where I didn't even feel like I was working that hard to put up the front, but the paddling beneath was really, really difficult. And I think that if tonight does nothing else, it can validate for adults within the community, whether you are a parent of a grieving child, whether you're a teacher of a grieving child, whether you're supporting grieving children in any which way, whether they're your neighbors or your friends, there's this philosophy that we don't want to rock the boat. The kid looks great, right? Grief rocks the boat. It just does. Losing a parent rocks the boat for a child. Loss rocks our lives. It just does. And so if a child is looking great, that doesn't mean they don't have pain. Children have the capacity to hold those two things so well sometimes. And of course, this is not to negate the fact that there are many children who walk around with really, really sad um, body posture and really sad facial expressions or anxious or all kinds of range of feelings. And that's completely normal too. But I'm here to say, let's not forget about those that look like they're doing so great because there's pain there as well. For me, the journey um, very much was a process, which we'll get on in some of the later conversations. But because I was so young when I lost my mother, most of my pain and most of my struggle and most of my real angst, if you will, came out between the ages of about 14 and 17, I'd say, which is what's clinically known as delayed grief. And that is just a fairly normal feeling. But of course, I didn't know that then. And so I doubted myself so often, wondering if I was crazy, if I was losing it, if I was maybe less than other people, if I maybe wasn't so strong. Right? These are all feelings that so many of children grapple with, and I certainly did. It took me any, many, many years into adulthood to recognize that what I was feeling 
was stuff that other kids who lost a parent was, were feeling as well. And so in 2006, I started Lynx as a publication just to support newsletter for teenage girls who lost a parent, just to be able to have a forum where they could share with one another. And from there, it grew and expanded. And at the end, I'll share with you some of the more recent services that we've added. But the point was that we wanted to create a sense of camaraderie because if there's one thing that griefers suffer from so much, it's loneliness. For me, it was a tremendous feeling if somebody had to ask me to highlight the one word to encapsulate my entire experience with grief, it would be loneliness. And I think that if there's one thing we can hope together to accomplish tonight, and I know so many of my esteemed panelists here are doing this in their respective fields, it's to make people feel less alone, to make people feel less isolated. And I thank OHEL for putting us all together on here to be able to do that, to share our journeys together, and hopefully together to understand that there's no way that what your experience is, is unique to you. There's somebody else suffering like this, and there is help available. And it takes so much courage, like I said, to be here, but this is the beginning of a hopeful journey of healing. So Rivka, thank you very much, not only for sharing your personal story, um, letting us know that opening up and sharing can be healing and learning from others was very helpful to you. You talk about loneliness, and I remember from one of our other seminars how the conversation not only centered on loneliness of people who were not surrounded by people, but there are too many individuals that are surrounded by so many people that also experience loneliness. And loneliness can come in so many different forms. You can be literally physically alone having lost a loved one, or you can also be lonely if you're surrounded by people and your antidote this evening is about sharing and talking about it and letting people other know your experiences and they may share their experiences with you and that helps. Thank you very much. My colleague Chaya Kohn is project director at OHEL for a comprehensive community-based mental health program. Chaya is an advocate for people who've experienced sibling loss. She runs bereavement groups for siblings and leads support programs at OHEL's Zachta National Trauma Center. Chaya Cohn, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, Chaya, on mute. Can you hear me now? Very good, thanks. Great. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, it's definitely Hi, we don't hear you. I'm sorry. It's definitely an incredible experience um, to be with everybody tonight. You still can't hear me? Now we can hear you. Now you can hear me. Okay, I will get up and close to my computer so that everybody can hear me. Um, I'm going to try my best to give a voice to the sibling loss, um, a voice I feel is so many times lowered. Um, so this is a story about my brother. My brother, Yona, was 24 years old when he died. Um, he died suddenly uh, in Israel in a car accident, and he left behind a child, a wife, siblings, parents, many people who loved him. Um, and he died doing a mitzvah, actually, a, a good deed. And truth be told, it took me many years to find comfort in that. What really helped was the ability uh, to have an open space for me to ask questions, for me to ask, you know, for me to ask about the pain. Um, <clears throat> But that was my brother in a nutshell. Um, he died the way he lived, helping others. Um, he was very big in giving smiles. Um, it was my year in Israel, and I happened to have been there the night before. And you don't realize, um, you, don't, you don't realize that you may not see your loved one again the next day. And hindsight's 2020. 
And you say to yourself, there's so many things that I could have said. Why didn't I say that? Um, but it, we didn't. Then I remember the next morning, my sister-in-law, she was translating an article from Hebrew to Russian. And it was an article about a car accident with a picture. The picture was of my brother's car. The best way I can describe that feeling of finding out that something was wrong with your loved one is when, you, when cold water is dumped on you or you jump into a very cold pool and that first initial reaction of your body shutting down and your body going, you're in freezing cold water and you can't breathe. That to me was how it felt in that moment. The amount of people that came into a very small apartment to tell me that my brother had died um, was definitely chaotic. And at the same time, time had slowed down um, and it became very difficult to figure out what was really going on. The thing about being a part of the lost sibling group, the lost sibling club, is that it's not only isolating and lonely, but we are shouldering the pain of not, not our own pain, but the pain of our parents, the pain of the widow, the widower, the children. We are viewed as the strong ones. We're viewed as the one that, well, the effect, how, how much did this grief affect you? We are the back burner. That's, that is what it feels like. When you lose a sibling, you lose a part of yourself, but you also lose that person you're supposed to go through stages of life with. Um, you're supposed to celebrate some clubs together, go through hardships together, you know, figure out how do I help my parents as they get older? That's something we do together. I recently celebrated um, my nephew's bar mitzvah two weeks ago. My nephew who was named after my brother. And I remember the photographer saying, okay, mom's siblings, let's take a picture. And my heart dropped. This is many, many years later from my brother's death. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, I'm gonna have to Photoshop him in because it's not a complete picture without him. Siblings, even in the same family, experience the grief very, very differently. My grief is not the same to my sisters or to my brothers. We had very unique experiences with very different relationships to my brother, Yona. And now I'm at a very different stage in my life. I'm at a stage in my life where I have children who are now understanding the concept of death and they are asking, they're asking questions about Uncle Yona. And I have to answer them and I want to answer them and they are painful. And I have questions myself on how do I answer these questions? And it's a new stage that I need to go through. But then I also very much appreciate the fact that I can talk about him now. That took a lot of time. Even now talking to all of you about him is a painful thing. It took time to do this. Um, but it's important to remember the good, the bad, the very funny things he did just to put a smile on people's faces. Nobody is just one thing. Nobody's just all good. And it's important to remember that people have many layers. And my brother had many layers to him, many wonderful layers to him. And I remember all those layers. What I found so helpful was my friends that did follow-ups. And they would reach out to me, not the day of the art site, but the month of the art site to see how I was doing. What is so helpful is not just the, the you know, the text message, remembering Yona, but also the check-ins, the follow-up, the check-ins, the, you know, could we go for a walk? How are you doing? Knowing that other people remember him, that other people remember him is a very powerful thing. It's very supportive. 
the truth of the matter is, is that I will never be the same that I was before. And I do every single day, try to keep his memory alive. I do, I try to smile like he did to others and to brighten other people's day. Um, and with the support of my agency, OHAL, I was able to start a sibling bereavement group um, along with my own sister. And we've been doing it for almost four years. And there are still members of that group that will come to me four years later and tell me that this was so powerful that we felt like we were not just alone, but nobody understood what a sibling bereavement felt like. There are so many things that you could do for your loved one. They're big, they're small, they don't have to be huge, like starting a bereavement group or starting an agency. Anything to keep your loved one's memory alive is important. This just happens to be my journey. Um, and I thank you all for listening to my journey. Thank you, Chaya. One of the uh, lessons that Dr. Blumenthal has taught us over the years is the importance of mentioning the name of the person who was lost, a spouse, a child, a parent, whoever it is. So thank you, Chaya, for introducing us to Yona. And you touched uh, upon the a little bit of the difference between a loss over time versus a sudden loss, an immediate loss. Uh, you spoke about how siblings may be viewed as the stronger person in the family who may be looked upon to support a spouse or to support a parent. And of course, um, siblings may experience the same profound loss and do experience the same profound loss and need the same amount of time and support as potentially any other family member. Everything is very personal, of course. It's a pleasure to introduce Glenn Holman, who specializes in grief and serves as a consultant to other clinicians and community members. Glenn also frequently speaks on grief in the community as he is doing this evening. He runs an organization called Mayrim in memory of his two daughters, who passed away. Mayrim runs events for families who've experienced the loss of a child with the goal of providing comfort, support, love by bringing them together with others who can relate to them. Glenn, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you very much, uh, David. It's really humbling to be amongst the other members of this panel, really people who are, have given so much of their life their expertise, their personal lives, shared their stories. Uh, to be on this panel is an incredibly humbling experience for me. And I wanna thank everybody here who, who attended. It's, it's hard to imagine the pain of the collective pain and loss that's been experienced. And I hope that we can a little bit help to just by being together, just by coming together and, and sharing our stories, we can um, find some comfort in that, if nothing else. I want to just give you a very short uh, background to my story. And before I say that, you know, in May Room, we do a lot of different things. You know, we have support groups and uh, we have different types of events, speaking engagements, do a lot of things. And whenever someone speaks, I ask them and I say, could you just say what works for me? Because grief is so individualistic. It's so unique to every single person. There's no one size fits all. There's no right, there's no wrong. It just is. This is what works for you, and what works for you may not be what works for someone else. So I'm going to share with you a little bit what works for me, and it doesn't have to be what works for you. And what I try to avoid, or I try to encourage people to avoid, is you know, what you need to do is this. People, you need to understand. You have to do this. You have to realize this is all this way or that way. And that's very difficult. It's difficult uh, among family members. It's difficult uh, amongst couples when there's this pressure to mourn and to grieve in a specific way. What I just want to share with you is just this idea. You know, when I was a kid, they, everyone talked about, they would say this phrase. They would say, where were you when John F. Kennedy was shot? And when I never understood it, 
until 9-11, when people would ask, where were you on the morning of 9-11? And then I understood it because there are certain moments in time that are frozen. They're so impactful, they're so significant that you'll never forget them. An example of that would be uh, like when you finally realize who you're gonna marry or standing under the chuppah, or it might be when you're holding your newborn child and you look in the eyes of this newborn baby and you say, I'm gonna protect you. I'm gonna take care of you. I love you. And those are those moments. And when my daughter in was 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 born, she had, we had one of those moments. I looked her in the eyes and I said those things. And five years later, we were sitting at a doctor's, a routine doctor's appointment. They said, your daughter is very sick. It was another one of those moments. And we spent several years we were, you know, caring for her. Her medical care was complex. We did whatever we could to make her life, um, the quality of life, as good as we could. And after she was in the hospital at one point in 2004, she had been in a coma for five weeks. And she finally had been awakened from her medical-induced coma. And I saw her after having not seen her for five weeks. And I looked at her and I said, I, I love you. I will always care for you. I will always protect you. And unbeknownst to me, that was the last time I ever spoke to her. Because she passed away two days later. And that date was August 3rd, 2004. And what I found was that moment we call point zero. That's what I heard it referenced as. It's called point zero. Point zero is because it's, everything is either before or after. Everything we look at in life, has, that's like that pivotal moment that, where there's the before and there's the after. And that applies to siblings, it applies to, um, to parents, right? I was different then. I remember before I was like this, now I'm like this. I don't know if I'll ever be the same. I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure who I am anymore. I've lost so much. And what we found was that we started to do pretty much within that year, we started to build this community because we realized that, especially among our kids, that they really felt very unsupported, very isolated. Someone asked the question earlier in the chat and they said, I feel like people look at me like we're contagious. People would cross the street when we walk. And there were lots of examples of people were comforting and supportive, but there were other times when we felt very isolated and very alone. And that applied to our kids, that applied to, to us as individuals. And we started to hear a lot of common threads. So we started to build this community. And over those next several years, you know, we had our annual retreat, we did some other things, and we started to realize that while grief is very different, there's something comforting about having somebody who's had, has experienced this type of loss. Just by knowing there are other people who could kind of understand us, that there were people out there who could kind of have a sense of what we, what we experienced. And what we found was that, that within that, there were so many differences. There was so much that was just hard to describe. It was so confusing. It felt like the pressure to, to move on, the pressure to get better, the pressure to just be over with it. It felt so incredibly um, intense. And we tried our best working together to try to find a way where we could support one another after point, you know, from before point zero till after and beyond. My daughter, Miriam, uh, it became very active in, in working in this community. She became incredibly active. It was almost like she had this mission. She felt Nechama was like her a guiding light to her. And Nechama was very inspiring other people. And, and, and Miriam, uh, you know, she took that very personally. And she said, I know what it's like to lose, to lose a sister. I'm going to help you. And as we tried to help support her and to be there for her and our other kids, right? Everybody reacting in very different ways. No one way, even the same family, same loss. That's one of the most um, amazing things, right? Same, same relationships, yet totally different reactions. And Miriam decided that she was become very active. And um, then we had another one of those moments in 2015. We got a call that Miriam was very sick. And Miriam spent the next few years very engaged in the community, especially among siblings, 
but also with parents, other parents like us, and became very active in that. And um, she spent really the next few years fighting, struggling, working. And in the summer of 2018, she decided she's gonna, we're gonna formalize this organization. Many people think we formalized this organization after she passed away, but we didn't. It start, the formulation of it started before she passed away. And that summer, right after the summer, she became, you know, actually Rosh Hashanah time, she became very, very ill. She was hospitalized for a few months and then she passed away. And then when she passed away, then we knew what we wanted to do. It wasn't a question. We knew exactly what we needed to do. That we were gonna start an organization called Miriam, named after Miriam. And what's so special, I think, about the community is the incredible support that the community is able to give one another. You know, it's, uh, I remember we had gotten, uh, even a few months ago, we got a, a, a invitation to a simcha and someone wrote, this simcha is yours because because of the community that was built, we were, our family was able to go through the process. Our family was able to heal. Our family was able to not fall apart. And if we didn't have those other people in the community, whether it be a girl the same age as some as a sibling or a mom or a dad, if we didn't have that, our family would have fallen apart. So I guess for us as a family, the reason that these two things are so combined is that for us, what helped us was to make meaning. It was to find, to connect with our children who we lost. And our feeling is that when we are, with the work that we're doing, right? I do it in my private practice, do it in an organization, and the same thing with my family within you know, many, many different uh, activities that we do. We make meaning, it's like they're with us. That's the way we hold on to them. Because one of the biggest challenges that people that I found, people I work with, uh, and even for us, is this idea that like you're stuck in a conundrum. Either I feel the pain and feel connected, or I'm numb. <laughs> so I don't have the pain, but I'm disconnected. And this is a very difficult, incredibly difficult conundrum, right? What kind of, what kind of terrible choice is that? It's kind of like the, the question I get asked, which is worse? Is uh, you know, accident? Is it illness? Is it an older kid? Is it a younger kid? And I always say, if you give me a choice, I'll take door number three. I don't want, <laughs> we're getting a choice. I'm not taking any of those. Those choices are terrible. So there's no worse. It's not this is worse than that. Each thing is individual and everybody kind of has their way that God willing, the strength of, of, of individuals and the community and, and the power of God I pray that people will, will everyone will find a way, a way forward, a way to connect, a way to share, a way to feel some kind of um, strength to be able to get through the difficulty, the, the incredible pain, the overwhelming pain at times. And by those things together, and hopefully everyone mm. will find a way forward. And that's what we pray for. And that's what we hope for. So it's not about making a choice. Right? It's not this is worse than that. It's everybody has their own way. And I am once again humbled to be able to have this opportunity to, uh, to speak with all of you and you know, overwhelmed by the, the pain that's here, just hearing the stories from the other panelists. It's, it's incredibly overwhelming. It's hard to believe. And it also is very inspiring incredible inspiration that I just personally go and speak for myself, right? What works for me. The only thing that I could say is that for me, you know, it's, it's humbling and also inspiring to see the people here, the strength, the strength of community, the strength of individuals to use what they have experienced to try to give back to others. And that's, what's been to some degree, that's a lot of what we try to do is to just make meaning out of our loss, to connect with those we've lost and to connect with each other and support one another. And I hope and pray that Mashiach will come very quickly, right? It's Tisha B'Av, this is the right time. We're ready. We're so ready. We're beyond ready. Mashiach should come. And in Mitz Hashem, we should all come together with Mashiach. When the chariots come, when the chauffeur's blown, we should all go together. And we should go to Eretz Israel and be reunited with everyone we've lost.
thank you very much for this opportunity and pass it to the next person. So Glenn, first of all, Amain, to all of your uh, comments and uh, wishes, Dr. Blumenthal, as in, in his introduction, spoke about the process of the nine days culminating with um, yearning and actually crying. One of the responsibilities and obligations we have on Tisha B'Av is to cry for the loss, for the destruction. And certainly there are people crying this evening, uh, listening to you speak about Nechama and Miriam. And I was really struck by the comment that you made that someone shared with you. Please come to our Simcha. The Simcha belongs to you. And that the way you shared your own personal journey helped another family, many families, help this family get through their difficult time. And they were letting you know that it was your support that helped them come to a point of a good time in their life of a simcha. You also mentioned the person that asked you which is worse. And it reminds all of us that well-meaning people sometimes ask not only silly questions, but I'll go on record in front of hundreds of people and say sometimes well-meaning people not only ask the wrong question, they ask stupid questions. And when we are helping and providing support to individuals going through such a difficult time in their life, that is not a time to ask, what happened? How long were they sick? Which hospital? Which doctor? Where did you go? Where did you travel? But rather, tell me a story about your daughter. Tell me a great story about your mother. Tell me what your husband or your wife love to do. I didn't know them. I would like to walk out knowing one great story about them. The good things, not the troubles and trauma that you've experienced in the past month or the past couple of years. Thank you very much, Glenn. I'd like to introduce Shani Waldman. Shani was only 37 years old when she lost her husband. And she was left with six young daughters, including a baby. Plagued by feelings of isolation and loneliness, she was determined to create a life of joy for her family. Together with a widowed friend, Vindy Halberstam, Shani co-founded Samchenu to support and nurture widows in the Jewish community. Shani, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. I'm really appreciative for everything that OHIL is doing and all the programs that you're doing that I know many of our Samchenu members have participated in. I was sitting on my front porch on an Adirondack chair sometime after my husband shocked us all by passing away after an illness that we thought he would recover from. We actually had an OHEL home on the corner uh, for developmentally disabled adults. And Alan Cohn was a very favorite, if you remember him, if any of the people here remember him, um, of that OHEL home, all the neighbors knew him. Nobody could see me, but I could see what was going on off my porch. And Rabbi Eisen said to Alan, he was coming out of his stroll down the block and he said to Alan, good morning, Alan, what did you have for breakfast? And the tears started. Just to have somebody ask me, an adult, what I had for breakfast, just to have another human being wonder if I ate breakfast. I was living in such an isolated world and nobody knew. Sarah Rifka, you spoke about that sense of isolation. Dr. Blumenthal has spoken to Samchenu frequently and especially when we first started. I remember the first time he spoke to a group of 12 women in Mawa and he said that the hardest part of any Sarah, the challenge, the struggle, is the loneliness of feeling I'm the only one who's here and the only one who's living the, in this. I would stand at the bus stop with my two and a half year old and my four year old, and I felt like the other woman at the bus stop thought that I'm the same as them. I make supper, I buy groceries, I buy my kids t-shirts and sneakers. I'm the same as them, just for one thing, I'm, except for one thing, I don't have a husband. 
Little did they know there was not one cell in my body and not one minute of my day that was the same as them. I was living on another planet in an alternate reality. A woman who loses a husband, it's not a family of eight minus one person and now it's a family of seven. Everything changes. It's not one thing, it's everything. I went to a few months back to be Menachem Avo, a young mother, and she knew who I was beforehand. I, I, it's a little hard to do cold calls at this point, but if somebody will call me and tell me to go, I will. But this time I knew the family. And I sat down and she looked at me and said, I feel that there's ESP going on here, extrasensory perception. In other words, she knew right away that I know so much about her existence without her saying a word or me saying a word. We live on the same planet. Really, I, the most important thrust of what I'd like to talk about today is really, um, Chaya Cohen said that, she said, I'm a different person, I'm not the same as I was. Um, she, uh, Glenn said, everybody's gonna do this their own way, but this becomes a part of who you are. Chaya talked about how many years later the photographer called for the siblings. There is no statute of limitations on grief. I call women on their birthdays. I don't necessarily know how old they are. I call the Samchenu member Goldie, and Goldie said, told me a story I'll never forget, and neither will you. Goldie told me she's 92 years old, and the last time she saw her mother, she was 15. They were online at Auschwitz. A few years back, she tells me, her mother's yard site is Shuiz. Her mother was a Hungarian Jew. And she said, Shuiz was a three-day yontif. Shabbos was our Shuiz. And Goldie went to her shear, and all the women were locked out. It was a boiling hot day, and the door was locked. So Goldie said, come to my house, you can have the shear in my house. The speaker saw the yard site candle and said, who's, who's the yard site for? So she gave her her mother's name and she gave the shear in honor of Goldie's mother's yard site. Later that day, Goldie had she what she calls a vision. She saw her mother's face. This is how she tells the story. And her mother was smiling. She said to me, I, it changed me. I'm a different person in the last few years. This is a woman who's 92 and telling me her life was changed because she saw this vision of her mother smiling. And she said, oh, I do have a mother. She's happy with me. She's happy with the children I raised. All those years, I was so hurt and in pain and alone because I had that whole, I didn't have a mother. And this offered her some degree of, of comfort. There's a lot of things we could learn from this story, but what I want to point out here is that it was 72 years later. There's no statute of limitations on grief. You didn't lose a camera. You can't buy another one. The person who lost somebody is changed forever. So many outsiders will say to me, uh, if you don't mind the word, somebody who isn't in our situation, have said to me, why doesn't she get over it already? And so many women themselves, widows, have said to me, what's the matter with me? It's so many years. Why is it still hurting? And the answer to all of you is what I just said. There's no statute of limitations. The whole is forever. The immediate burning, searing, horrible pain is not forever, but the loss is forever. Until Mashiach comes, that person is still missing. You can't replace a person and the loss is still there. My children, for those of, of, of you who know them or for those in the community who know them, are, are confident, well-adjusted and successful adults and young adults. One of my children a few years back, the story is very telling, especially if you know them. A few years back had a run-in with the camp. She wasn't accepted in camp because she hadn't been there the year before, or she wasn't accepted for a job she wanted because they claimed that since she missed a year, she didn't get priority. My daughter said to me, they're treating me like I'm a regular kid. I'm not a regular kid. She's not a regular kid. You look at her, and this is what Sarah Rifka said. You look at that face and you look at me. My neighbors all looked at me like I'm coping, I'm great. They sent me suppers for a year while I was in Houston, Texas, away from my family, but they never got my inner world. And it's not their fault. We wouldn't want them to. But what I can say to everybody who's listening today is to be sensitive to that. The griever is grieving, whether you see it on the outside or not. We were asked to put together a list of do's and don'ts, and I'd like to give them to you quickly. Um, 
David Mandel said, and this was first on my list, not to ask questions. I will say any questions at all, not to me and not to my kids. People take advantage of the little kids and want to ask them questions. I coached my kids. I said, say to an adult, I don't feel comfortable with that question. I don't think any of them ever did it, but at least I prepared them. Don't ask what happened. Don't ask for details of the illness. Don't ask, where are you for Shabbos? Don't ask, what are your summer plans? If you're inviting me for Shabbos, of course say, I'd like to have you for Shabbos, but don't ask questions just to make conversation. Um, don't give hashkafa lessons. I'll try to translate it that in English. Life lessons to try to explain to the person that you know why it happened. My friend said, everybody became my hashkafa teacher afterwards. Don't withdraw from the relationship or cross the street. Um, my partner, Brandy, and I once had this discussion when we're at a simcha, especially a family simcha, do we want people to mention it? Brandy said, she's at a simcha. She wants to enjoy herself. Why would she want someone to talk about the loss? And I felt like I'll be so sad if nobody mentions my husband. Does that mean that they forgot about him? So here you have two widows who can't even agree on the right thing to say. How is everybody else supposed to know what to say? And David said, people say stupid things. Don't say nothing. Say, I'm thinking of you. Here are the do's. Listen more than you speak. Be present. Here's the time for emor ma'at say harbe. Say little and do a lot. Do, do for the person. My neighbor, when, she, when my husband's hair fell out, this is literally a world lesson in how to give. When his hair fell out, she didn't call me. She didn't ask me any questions. Her 10-year-old daughter showed up at my back door with an entire meat fleshic supper. And she didn't ask me that if, she, if I wanted it, she didn't offer it, so I didn't have a chance to say no. If I had cooked supper already, I could have it the next night. It was a little kid, so I didn't have to start explaining and thanking her profusely. And she did this every week for until we discussed. But um, and and then she said she was the one who organized suppers for a year. Somebody else used to bring kogel every hour of Shabbos until I said my kids aren't eating the kogel anymore. That's okay. And then she started bringing me the mishpacha every hour of Shabbos. She was showing me I'm here. Ask your friend if she'd like to go for a walk. Invite her out to lunch. Follow her cues. Some people want to talk and some people don't. Just keep remembering her. Don't stop. Say, I'm thinking of you. I know this is not a, a Pirkei Avos class, but it, it always touched me. Rav Shem Shem Rafal Hirsch says on Hevei Mekabalas Kol Adam Besever Panim Yafos that you should greet every person with a happy face. In his eloquent fashion, he says that every person that you meet should feel that you would do anything you could to the best of your ability to help them in any way that you could. I wish that we would address every human being in that way. But at least to a widow, to someone who's grieving, they should feel those kid gloves. We want to be treated like a regular kid, but also to be remembered. I'm not a regular kid. Johnny, thank you very much. There's a couple of things that you said uh, that are very striking. One of them is there's no statute of limitations on grief. And you told the story about people who lost someone 50, 60, 70 years ago in the Shoah, or could have been grandparents that they lost years ago and decades ago. And um, I also loved your comment. Hey, you didn't lose a camera. We're not discussing about a camera over here. You know, we're grieving about individuals. They can be replaced. Um, and all the do's and don'ts that you reminded people. Um, I know so many people say, tell me when you're available for a weekend, I'd like to invite you for a Friday night meal. And you said, how about saying, are you available this Friday night? We'd love to have you join if you're free this Friday night. No, I'm not free. Is next Friday night good? And if the answer is no, that means that you need to step back. So those are great do's and don'ts, recommendations to people, very practical. Let me come back again to my colleague, Dr. Norman Blumenthal, a very wise person, OHEL's Director of Trauma of the Zach the Family National Trauma Center. Dr. Blumenthal. Thank you very much. Uh, we might not be grieving a camera, but one of our panelists is grieving her glasses. But um, 
hopefully she'll get them replaced. Um, I just learned tonight about a new type of uh, trauma. Um, and that's the trauma of having to speak after Sarif Kakon, Chaya Kon, Glenn Holman, and Shani Waldman. Uh, this is not an, this, this is a very hard group of acts to follow. Uh, I'd like to conclude by citing briefly a certain, a, a, a certain part of the Talmud and then share a story from my own background. Um, the Talmud, the Gemara, in Moed Cotton, which is in the third paragraph, which uh, the third chapter, which deals with grieving, at one point addresses something very peculiar. And I'm just going to paraphrase it. I'm not going to read it. But Sir Rabbi Abohu says that the mourner sits at the head of the table. And what does he cite as a verse to explain this? Is a verse that describes the mourner as a king. And another person says the same law that the the the, the um, mourner should sit at the table, and he cites a verse from Amos, which refers to the mourner as a prince. Now, I can ask everybody here, when you were sitting Shiva, I don't think you found it to be a very regal experience. I don't think you felt like a king or a queen. Um, if anything, you were heartbroken, you, were, you felt maybe even cheated, harmed, compromised. How, do, how did the Talmud come to describe the mourner as a king or a queen? But I think there was a very important message, and I think it's a message we heard very much tonight. When you pay a shiva visit and when you want to comfort the bereaved, they're in charge. They're the kings. They are the leaders. Listen to them. Hear what they say. Read the body language. And don't, don't offer them solutions but hear from them what they need, and then you'll be comforting. You'll be doing comfort uh, from bereavement. We, we have a tradition to try to end on a positive note. And this is a hard subject to end on a positive note, but um, I'd like to share with you a story I heard from my mother, Leah Shalom, uh, from her experiences during the Holocaust. My mother was an extremely brilliant, eloquent woman who survived seven concentration camps including Auschwitz. And uh, I was able to prevail upon her to do the video testimony. Um, many of you are familiar, it was ultimately Steven Spielberg's project, but it was a project of Yale before that and before that the self-help agency. And I had done some of the interviews and she agreed to do the interview. And as I said, she was an incredibly eloquent woman, spoke like seven languages. And she was going through the whole experience from the ghetto to, to Raisin and she, was, she didn't cry, she didn't shed a tear, but she broke down when she described the scene upon her arrival in Auschwitz. And what the scene was, was when they carved the number on her arm. And as they were engaged in this barbaric, dehumanizing act, she said there was a Nazi in charge, it was one of the most brutal that she encountered in all her experiences. And by his side was a Jewish woman who was extremely attractive, well-fed, well-dressed, and her exalted status was for obviously dubious reasons. And as they were tattooing the number on my mother's arm, this woman bent down and said to her, when you get freed from this place, you'll buy a big bracelet and it'll cover it up. And my mother said to her, and you will get free too. And she nodded her head and prophetically said, no, I won't. And at that point, my mother broke down and started crying. And she's sobbing. And um, the interviewer, as we had to do in these interviews, just waited for her. And finally, when she somewhat composed herself, clutching a handful of tissues and sobbing, she said to the interviewer, I'm not crying over the cruelty. I'm crying over the kindness. As David mentioned, in a few days, we're going to be crying. We're going to be crying over Tisha B'Av. I'm going to be crying for our communal loss. And we'll be crying for all the individual losses that we heard about tonight and among the many audience who I can see from just briefly perusing the Q&A who have suffered their losses. We're going to cry together. But I think we can also cry over the kindness, cry over the kindness that we see tonight of all the wonderful organizations, of all the individuals who have taken their challenges and used them to help others. And I have no doubt, as, as Glenn mentioned, that this kindness 
will hasten the arrival of the Messianic era and the reunion of all families. Thank you. Dr. Blumenthal, thank you very much. Um, we have many questions that have been posed for before this evening and during this evening. And before I go to a question, which actually the first question I'd like to go to reverses this conversation on grief. I, I would just like to offer uh, one thought, personal thought. So many people are sharing their personal thoughts. My father died when I was a young man. And I have difficulty remembering things about my father. It's many years ago, many decades ago. And I have some stories, some recollections, but I have difficulty remembering things about my father, Oliver Shalom. My mother died a few years ago. And like Norman's mother, she had a number. And I took upon myself, when my mother died, to carry her number to continue her number. Uh, as a child of survivors, we have a very strong belief about continuing the memory, never forget if you will. So I carry my mother's number on me. It's not a tattoo. I literally carry it on me. It's not something that I look at or I touch, but I know that it's there. So my thought is that some people, many people start an organization like so many individuals that are sharing with us. And people have a picture in the house and a video, which they should. However, people can remember one story, the name in some way to carry it with you, both literally and figuratively, at least one good story. And like Dr. Blumenthal said, that makes you smile not the sad story that makes you sad, but that makes you smile and makes you happy. That's a very good way to retain a memory and to retain something long-term. A question was asked, I'd like to pose it to several people this evening to begin with Glenn. The question is asked, I'm, I'm describing it as the reverse of grief, meaning how do people grieve? Well, what about the person who's not experiencing grief, who's not able to grieve? They've experienced a tragic loss. Person asks that he was 24 years old when his mother passed away, and she was a young age of 45, and she was sick for nine years. The family is considered a coping family, a strong family. And the family continue to try to continue. Everything is normal for around the nine years of illness with a healthy, happy home where nothing was lacking throughout the nine years of illness. This person writes, I found that keeping such a strong mindset, I don't even know how to grieve. Glenn, you went through two children through several years apart. It's inconceivable. He describes that I cannot access, I cannot reach, I cannot touch my grief. And I'm wondering if that is okay, if there's something wrong with me, how do I get there? I'm not grieving. Am I healthy? Glenn. Yeah, well, it's a very broad question. So I'm going to try my best to answer it as best I can, because that's, you know, there's so many nuances and, you know, if it was someone I was speaking to, I'd have a hundred uh, <laughs> questions, you know, follow up questions to try to understand that. You know, I think generically, as I've shared, there's no right way to grieve, but it's also okay. You know, I, a lot of the, the private questions that people are asking is around this, you know, around similar topics. Like I have a child who lost a sibling, they're not grieving, how do I get them to, to grieve? or my spouse isn't grieving, how do I get them to grieve? And there are circumstances where, you know, people would be appropriate for people to perhaps seek professional help or to, um, to do other things outside of what I'm saying. I think that the way I perceive it is that 
it's okay. Sometimes the way that we grieve or the way that we cope with the grief, the loss is not to actively pursue it, right? Sometimes we just need time, right? Sometimes we need space. Sometimes we need safety. So it's not always, I think there's a, there's a lot of pressure. I, I get this question a lot, like with kids, especially. Um, someone called me up to say, you know, I have, there's been a loss in the family, sadly. And I have this uh, 12 year old, 15 year old, 18 year old, you know, how do I get them to therapy? How do I force them to therapy? So one of the things I say about that always is, um, I, if they'll answer, I say, you in therapy, right? So before we start sending all the kids to therapy and forcing them and so on. So I asked them, are you in therapy? I say, no, no, I don't, I don't need it. How do you deal with your grief? Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't deal with it myself. So is that wrong? So I don't think that, I think there's a lot of pressure for people that they have to grieve, they have to feel it, they have to get the intensity of it. And I think it's okay for a person who's um, not in that place, that they can give themselves the safety and the time. Now, someone who, I think what I hear always in the back of that question is always, I wanna connect, right? I'm feeling this disconnection, I'm feeling this distance and space. So how do I kind of, back to what I was saying, you know, when I was speaking earlier, how do I connect with the person I've lost, right? In a way that I can feel not, no, not overwhelmed. And there's different ways to do that, right? That's a very individualistic, um, you know, answer, whether that be, it might be talking to a therapist, it might be um, writing, right? It might be, um, depending on the age, there's all kinds of activities, so to speak, techniques that people could do. I just, I guess what I want to point out that, the, the pressure to have to grieve, part of that also comes sometimes from a sense of, of guilt, right? Betrayal, right? If I'm not grieving, what does that say about me? Some people get stuck in that, right? I've seen many times people will get stuck. They won't allow themselves to move forward. They won't allow themselves to succeed because I'm supposed to be grieving. I mean, it's supposed to be harder for me and either by, about themselves or about someone in their family. So I think, you know, the answer to, the secret sauce is there's no one right way. It's okay. If this is the way that you are um, managing it by not thinking about it during that time, that's my personal opinion, that's okay. Now, if a person is not functioning and you know because they're avoiding the grief and therefore they have to function, it's a little bit of different circumstance. So that's how I'd answer that question, very broadly. Then you see that in a shiva house, if there are four or five, six people sitting shiva, they're grieving in four or five, six different ways. And each one yeah. of those ways is perfectly fine. It's how they experience it, and it's how they show it or they speak about it. We have two colleagues uh, this evening from an organization called Our Tapestry, Hanedvar Goldberg and Miriam Greenfield. Hanedvar or Miriam, would you like to comment on the question about this individual is not necessarily grieving, and is that okay? Hanedvar or Miriam? Um, I'll just say that I think it's perfectly fine. Um, like everybody else, first of all, I just want to say thank you for having us here. And I just picked up so many important notes, pointers, and tidbits that I'm going to take home with me and use. I'm just in awe. And I just feel that each person on their own grieves differently. And there's like everybody else said, there's no right and there's no wrong. And I would just, you know, just take it from there. I, I do feel very strongly that communication is very important. Um, peer support is very important. And we find in our tapestry that in, within our groups, we find massive support of each other. Um, and I guess maybe Chandra, you want to say something else? I, I, I feel that uh, you answered what I would say. But, uh... Dr. Blumenthal, can you give us a quick uh, comment about the difference between grieving and depression? At what point does one go into the other? Yeah, okay, I... so, uh, so that's, uh, that's about a two-hour discussion, so I hope people are willing to... <laughs> but... Um, the, the basic difference is that in depression, there's a disconnect between 
the one person's mood and the reality of their lives. Their life is regular, normal life, and they're terribly sad. And the function and purpose of curing depression is to make the, the person's mood commensurate with the reality of their lives or to sort of elevate their mood, which is what's done through psychotherapy. And psychotherapy has about an 80% success rate with uh, depression. Uh, in grief, the sadness is not only legitimate, not only commensurate the reality of their lives, but is necessary for achieving consolation because it is through the pain of, of grief that uh, the consolation is achieved. And that's the re reason, by the way, why a, a traditional psychotherapy for grief, most of the research shows is at best ineffectual and sometimes even harmful because a technique that's, supposed to, that's aimed to elevate the mood is completely inappropriate in grief, just as the comments during Shiva, which are aimed at making someone feel better, really has no place in, in grief. I, I wanna just add one more point, which speaks, I think, to what a lot of people are talking about, and it's a very important, and it's a line I use often, and I share with other people that appreciate it. There's a very big difference between being affected and damaged. There's no question that everybody who's experienced the losses we're talking about today are profoundly affected and affected for a lifetime. That doesn't mean they're damaged. They're actually, or show as we've witnessed tonight from our participants, incredible strength and resilience and recovery. So again, keep that in mind that everybody is profoundly affected, doesn't mean they're damaged. So Rivka Cohn, as Issa links, I'd like to pose a question to you. This um, person writes, his um, father died. Actually, I don't know if it's a, a man or a woman writing the question. Um, my dad died suddenly when I was eight. He was 31. I still have questions surrounding his death that I logically know that I will never have the answers to. How do I finally stop thinking, what if? I can't grieve him because I don't remember him. I'm grieving what could have been had he survived. The what if is such a strong question and it's asked in so many different ways. So Rivka. So I, I, first of all, I thank the person who brought up the question because I'm sure it's something that sits on many people. I think I would divide this question into two parts. There's the what if piece. Um, and read me the end, there was a line there again that I, I wanted to highlight. That was the, the last ending. I'm sorry, David. What was, the, what was the last line the person said? Was that they, they were grieving their, they don't remember, right? I can't grieve him because I don't remember him. Right. I'm grieving what could have been had he survived. There's a All grief. the moments, the yeah. transitions yeah. in life, the opportunities. Yeah, there's a, there's a great line that I've heard multiple times from Dr. Sporokazowicz, which is, Death doesn't happen in the past, it happens in the future. And it's affected me in many different ways that I've viewed it. And the reason it happens in the future is every milestone person can feel like, oh, now I needed this person, now the person's not here. And that is actually a normal process of grief is you know, when milestones happen, when different, you know, many of the speakers alluded to different events within their life that reminded them of the deceased I think the part that's that's painful sometimes is when you were very young and there are no memories there to even go back to, um, to create, so to speak. Like, what if this person was at my simcha, at my um, wedding, at my bar mitzvah? What if this person was here when I got my first job? What if this person saw me graduate, right? All these these questions that a person has, and they can't even like, it's almost like a foreign object sometimes to even imagine how that could be possible. I have to say that I think the answer to that is to sit with it. It is, the unknown is sitting with it. We don't know, we will never know. And there's pain in that grief and that's okay. Let that, let that be there. Let that be something you can feel. And by not fighting this feeling of what if, yeah, I welcome it, what if? What if this person was here to see my grandchildren? What if this person was here to see me get married? And, and there's pain to that. And there's also the different what ifs. It's what if they were here and they would be so proud of what you're doing? And, and let that feeling also wash over you. 
I'm not asking this question to anyone in particular, so anyone can um, jump in and answer the question. And um, I guess I'm looking at Shani because I really don't know you. Um, and I don't know where you're holding in life. I know you from these conversations in preparation for tonight. Someone asked a question about remarriage, remarrying, and how it affects uh, the children, uh, whether it's a, um, a man marrying, um, um, remarrying a, a woman or a woman remarrying a man. And the children still are grieving or are not ready to move on. And, you know, how did, how do they deal with it? And they want to remember the memories, but life also moves on. Um, how, how, do, how do we advise families, spouses who are remarrying to um, allow their children to grieve while they also have a right and want to move on with their lives? And I'm trying to say every single word ever so carefully. Shani. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to tell you what I think, but I think you have to ask Dr. Blumenthal also. So we'll and Dr. Blumenthal is smiling while I say that. Um, I've heard from Dr. Blumenthal and from other people as well a, a basic which is that children of any age single or married children can totally wreck a remarriage. Um, I will answer that the children are grieving and will always be grieving as has been discussed tonight. Um, I'm trying to think fast while I'm answering you because I obviously didn't prepare for this. Um, the grief is going to be forever and the children might never be ready. The married children already have a spouse and they're building a life. I have, there are over 2,600 women in Samhainu and I know many of them personally. And I cannot count how many times I've heard a woman say to a younger woman, remarry while you're younger. I waited and I lost the chance. So not everybody gets a chance to remarry, but if the person has the chance, obviously things have to be put in place. There should be time for the children to at least begin the grieving process. The deceased spouse should have a place in the household. They should not be out of the picture. They, the, the, the past happened. It doesn't get erased. So everybody could have different ways of doing that, but it shouldn't be taboo and there's there should be the possibility of, it shouldn't be, why shouldn't you be able to stay at the dining room table? Oh, you know, their mother or their father or whatever it is. This is a family coming together under a circumstance. And sometimes one spouse is not, is, is a divorced spouse. That could also happen, but that should be part of the agreement beforehand that we're not erasing the past in whatever way that you decide. Uh, I'm also tiptoeing here, uh, David, but I don't know if there's a specific halacha, and I'm not asking it about whether you can attend a yard site suda um, with, together with your children, even after you're remarried, and a lot of other things like that to make the children feel that this is, that this is um, something that you haven't overlooked. But I think that the, 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 the parent also needs to be able to live and, and, um, and, you know, I didn't say this before, but it's not natural to be alone. When God created the world, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. That was said about man and woman. And because that was the way the world was created, we can go forward. We can create happy lives. And everyone on this chat, on this panel, on this webinar has done so. They've created happy lives after their loss, with their loss in their heart and despite their loss. But that loss is always going to be there and they are not, it's never going to be okay for a woman to be alone because it wasn't built into their DNA. So a spouse should be able to get married. I, I want to have fun. one more personal story very quickly. Um, it was at the Haas concert. I was sitting with my new husband on one side of me and with my one of my married children on the other side of me. And onto the video screen came a whole choir singing, Daddy, Come Home. I spent almost a year in Houston with my husband getting a stem cell transplant while six children waited at home for the daddy who never came home. I do not express emotion in public, but the tears started. And my husband handed me a tissue and my daughter who doesn't mince words said to me, mommy, I thought you're happy. And I said to her, Hashem put the words in my mouth because it was like a moment, but I said to her, Getting remarried resolves the grief of losing my young husband. I'm sorry, getting, let me fix that.
getting remarried resolves the grief of being alone, but it will never resolve the grief of losing my young husband. And that's the message that children have to hear. Shani, you amplified so beautifully on uh, so Rivka Cohn's comment, the death doesn't happen in the past, it happens in the future. The fact that you get remarried doesn't mean that you forget the past. The fact that you get, get remarried doesn't mean that your children don't have their biological father. Um, and they always will in every single way that they remember it. And everyone has a responsibility to remind them and to talk about it and to keep that name, as Dr. Blumenthal always says, mention the name, mention the name. This has been a, I don't know what word to use, a remarkable, a powerful, a wonderful, an exhilarating and informative. I think I'm going to say it's been a very smart evening. So many individuals have said so many things. Um, our colleagues from our tapestry, Hanedvar Goldberg and Miriam Greenfield, so Rivka Cohn from Zisa Links and Shlomi's Club, uh, Glenn Holman from Mayrim, um, Shani Waldman um, from Samchenu, and my colleagues, Chaya Cohn at Ohel, uh, Sivi Ryder, and Cheryl Sharanowski at Ohel, and Dr. Norman Blumenthal, Ohel's uh, director of the Zakta Family National Trauma Center. We have the same number of people that are still listening this evening as starting an hour and a half ago. And that in itself is a commentary about the importance of this evening. And as Dr. Blumenthal said, we end on a happy note. So as Glenn mentioned, as we're going into Tisha B'Av, in whatever way we experience it in our own way, uh, may this be the last Tisha B'Av that we are mourning for the loss of the Beis HaMikdash and for the loss of everyone that we've lost. And uh, may we all see everyone next year and everyone that we've lost in some way and remember them and continue these important conversations. Everyone have a wonderful night.